going to share with you today about God's grace and salvation, and I'm going to do so out of chapter 2 here in the book of Titus. Let me read to you verses 11 through 14, and uh, then we'll get into our study. Titus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, reading to verse 14. Paul writes, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, <clears throat> and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So what we have here as we introduce our subject is uh, Paul encouraging believers to be ready to be with Christ, to be ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this expectation for the Lord to return has fueled the church and has helped us to be prepared that we might see him. When you read your New Testament, when you break it down, there are 260 chapters in the New Testament. In, in the 260 chapters of the New Testament, the return of Christ is mentioned 318 times. So that means one verse in every 25 specifically mentions his return. The only New Testament books that don't mention this return are the book of Galatians and 2nd and 3rd John. And so the hope of being with Christ, the hope of being with Jesus is what is intended to propel us. It's intended to compel us. It's intended to fuel us to live for Christ in these last days. It, it, it's what is intended to motivate us to be prepared to see him when we do. In John 14, Jesus said it like this in verses 2 and 3. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he's gone to prepare a place for us. He's coming to, uh, to, to take us to be with himself. And, and the question we have to to ask ourselves today if that's a fact. If that's true, if he really did that, then are we ready? Because if we're ready, that means our lives are going to be different. They're going to be different than those who don't believe. They're going to be different than those who do not believe he'll return. In 1 John 3, 2 and 3, John said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet re been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So, if the Lord is returning, and I'm going to assume that the majority of us in this room believe that he is. So, if the Lord is returning, the question is, how then should we live? What kind of life are we to live? How can we be strong in these last days. Well, we're to live a life of faith, expecting and prepared to be with Jesus at any time. And his return for us is going to come quickly. We're not going to know the moment, but we need to be prepared. I read something about a, a particular Japanese soldier. His name was Onada Hiruo. He was the second lieutenant in the Imperial Japanese Army. And he was sent to the Philippines island of Labang in 1944 with orders to remain until relieved of duty. His commanding officer said he would return for him, and he waited almost 30 years. A young Japanese adventurer encountered him in the jungle, told him the war had ended, and Onada would not surrender his sword until the retired commander came to the island. That's living with expectation. And he had the only Toyota dealership on that island. It's amazing, <laughs> but it's true. But that's living with expectation. That's living with an obedience to a command, to a promise. And uh, that's what we're supposed to do too. You see, the Bible tells us, and we'll see this in verse 11, how the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In other words, God's saving grace has become clearly known and it's been openly manifested. His saving grace has been openly manifested in Christ. God has openly shown his favor toward us by giving us his son, Jesus God's grace came to the rescue, and God's grace has saved men from the greatest possible disaster. Now, what is the greatest possible disaster? The greatest disaster that is possible 
It's coming under the wrath of God. It's coming under the judgment of a righteous and mighty warrior God. In Psalm 75, 8, it says, For in the hand of the Lord there's a cup with foaming wine well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Paul told uh, the Romans that there is no fear of God before the eyes of unbelievers. You see, there's a belief today that God ignores evil, but the sad truth is he doesn't. He's patient. He's long-suffering. He's withholding his judgment, giving us opportunity. But the Bible says it's appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment. You see, what has happened is our, our... our world is, especially the United States, which seems to lead the world in these kinds of things, but our world is filled with casual sin, and our world is filled with hardened hearts. I was writing down a few of these things just to remind myself, though I don't really need to be reminded of this, but look around right now. Look in this nation that we love so much, this nation that is such a beautiful light. It used to be a light to the world, right? A standard for the world. Look around and see what it's like now. None of us are asleep. All of us are awake enough to see this. What's going on is, is terrible. You know, without going into politics, because I don't necessarily want to and don't really enjoy doing it, but I will point out this. You know, what is taking place with Trump is just is pure evil, and it's something we're seeing. It's pure evil, guys. There's an, over, there's an overthrow of the government that's taking place right now, and many of us are asleep to it, but it's true. This is what's taking place. And when you look around a society that we're living in, American children are sexualized. Pornography is found in elementary school libraries. Children tell their their teachers that they have a new gender and the parents aren't being notified. Abortion is glorified as a choice. We have drag queens reading storybooks to our children. Girls can be taken to have an abortion without parental consent. And masculinity is called toxic. This is what we're living in right now. This is the world we're living in. The things that have been normalized and, and are actually being rewarded are, are sinful things. In Romans 1.32, um, it, it, it speaks of those who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of eternal death and not only uh, do the same but approve of those who practice them. That's what we have today. There are people who not only do those things, but approve of those who practice and then oppose those who resist it. We're not to live this way. As a matter of fact, we're to live an entirely different way. We're to die to such a way of life. In Colossians 3, 5, and 6, Paul said it like this. He said, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming And so we stand, even now, deserving of judgment. But God has provided a way of escape. Notice again in verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's grace through Christ has been revealed, and it shows us how we can be saved. And how we can be saved is is encapsulated in what is called the message of the gospel. And that's the message we've been called to give to a world the message of coming judgment, but also the grace of God that will save you from it. It's called the gospel of grace. And this gospel of grace comes through Christ and and it's salvation from the judgment. And as a righteous judge, God will judge the unredeemed sinners. The Bible makes it very clear. There's, There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not a single person uh, around who, 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 who can claim sinlessness. We're all sinners. And, and the guy who says, I'm not a sinner, well, he's, he's not married. Because <laughs> all I have to do is ask the wife. And that's that. Yep. So as sinners, the Bible makes it clear we stand condemned. But Jesus Christ has provided forgiveness for us. Jesus poured out his blood, and by faith we are saved through the grace of God. In Romans 5, verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And that's the message that I want to give to you as we open today, a message of of the gospel of grace 
And I want you to notice again in verse 11 that this gospel of grace is for all men. It's for everybody. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, the scripture says God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And this is a grace of salvation, but it's also a grace that teaches us how to live in a way that pleases the Lord. It's a grace that intends to teach us something. It teaches us. Now, notice verse 12. It says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So grace teaches us. Grace trains us how to live. And grace trains us how to live holy, not unholy lives. Now, some today are living in unrepentant sin, and they're referring to it as grace. But that's not true. By doing this, they reveal that they do not know a holy God. I was reading recently of the United Methodist Church, and their delegates repealed the church's longstanding ban on LGBTQ clergy with no debate removing a rule forbidding self-avowed practicing homosexuals from being ordained or appointed as ministers. So you have churches ordaining homosexuals, unrepentant homosexuals. And the sad thing is they're, they're, they're rejecting Scripture. John Wesley, who was the originator of that particular denomination, must be spinning in his grave. They're rejecting God's Word. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't happen. And he says, do not be deceived. But you see, because of his grace... We can reject ungodliness. We can reject worldly lust. Understanding the incredible sacrifice of Jesus has been driven deep within us by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You know, there are those running around right now saying that they're born-again homosexuals. That's true. I mean, it's, that's a big movement. Some of you guys may not be aware of it right now. There are people out there on the lecture circuit going out, they're selling books, saying, you know what? You know, I just, I, I'm just i a born-again homosexual. But that's like saying I'm a cannibal that's fasting. There's no way that that happens. I've shared this before. I'll say it quickly. I was in a particular class in college, and it was a sociology class. And I got there early, and there was a fellow who was seated next to me, and he began to speak to me. And uh, I forget exactly where our conversation began, but at a certain point, he said something about being, a re he said, I'm a recovering alcoholic. And uh, I said, oh. And he goes, yeah, how about you? I said, I'm a recovered alcoholic. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, I'm not an alcoholic. I said, I once was, but now I'm not. I said, at one time I was addicted to alcohol, but I'm no longer. I said, you know, the Bible says this. It says, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I said, what I was once I am no longer. I am brand new in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know. And so I don't identify with my sin. My sin, my sin and your sin, our sin has been washed by the blood of Christ. Our sins have been cast into the deepest portion of the ocean, never to be drawn up again. And we're not to be reminded of them anymore. The enemy will whisper in your ear what you were, but all you have to tell him is where he's going. Because the bottom line is, is that the Lord has done a work in us to transform us. And we need to understand that, fellas. Don't get caught up with this, well, I'm still an alcoholic. Listen, if you gave your heart to Christ, were your sins washed? Yes. If you gave your heart to Christ, were you born again? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit live within you? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit powerful? Amen. Can he transform lives? Yes. Are you a testimony of that? Yes. God changes lives. Don't forget that. Don't live as if he doesn't. God transforms you. Don't forget that. We need to understand that today. We need to be men in the, in the grace of God. We need to understand that we reject these things. We reject ungodliness. We reject worldly lust. We understand the incredible sacrifice of Christ, and that's been driven within us. God loved us, and he gave us his son so that we could be free 
And our lives are living testimonies of the transforming power of grace. We don't just outwardly act differently. From the inside, we are different. And so he speaks about ungodliness. Jesus gives us a power to resist living as if God does not exist. Grace teaches us to reject all things that would deny God in our lives. Now, worldly lust, that's speaking of living for the things that we eat, we drink, we put on. His grace gives us the power to resist satisfying fleshly lust. His grace motivates us to live for him because even as men, and this can be difficult for men to actually think of it, so I'll say it and make it difficult for you for a moment. Because we're in love with a man. We're in love with the man. We're in love with Jesus Christ, our Savior, our King, our Lord, our Savior, and we love him. We love him. There was a fellow who went to one of the universities in Texas, and he, it was Gay Pride Day, so he asked if he could speak. And they said, yeah, sure, of course. And he got up and he said, I'm in love with a man. And all of the people there were going, oh, yes, you know. He says, he's a perfect man. He's a loving man. He's a kind man. And they're all nodding their head. I have the perfect man in my life. And then he went on to say, and that man is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ can change your life too. That's the bottom line. And so we're in love with the Lord. We love him with all of our heart. And we pursue those things that please him. And we want, to, we want to be pleasing to him. God forgave us. I don't know how often you fellas meditate on that. I do quite frequently. I haven't forgotten what I was. I never will. I don't think I'm supposed to. I haven't forgotten what I was. And I'm grateful every day because he took me out of the miry clay and he set my feet on a solid rock, Jesus Christ, and he transformed me. And I have a gratefulness in my heart. I have a thankfulness in my heart for that. You know, I was always I raised in a home like many of you I know. Men were this way, we were raised this way. My generation, there's probably not much different in this than yours. I didn't have a father who said, I love you. My father never said, I love you until I was 17 years old. My father showed no emotion. My father was just a hardworking man, provided for the family, put food on the table, clothes on your back, shoes on your feet. That was my dad. So he never felt it necessary to say I love you because he thought, well, I'm showing you every day this is what I do. I work. I feed you. I care for you. I protect you. But he never said I love you. So I never, I never learned how to say that either. I didn't know how to say I love you to anybody. Emotion, my father never showed emotion. Men didn't show emotion. Men kind of suck it up and just do what you got to do. That's what men do. And I'm still that way, to be honest with you, in many ways. You do what you got to do. You know, that's what you do. Men do that. I mean, that's what we are. So it surprises me that when I got saved, my emotions started coming because I didn't like it. And I still don't. You know, this church, those of you who come to this fellowship know that. I have a difficult time sometimes because when I'm speaking, I get emotional. I don't like it at all because I... It's just the opposite of what I really feel inside in terms of what I want to reveal to you. But one of the things the Lord has taught me a long time ago is Jesus wept and so can you. You know, Jesus cried over cities and Jesus cried over people and it's okay to show an emotion, especially one of love. And how can you help but do that? There's a woman in the Bible who speaks of how she came up to Christ and she began to weep and began to anoint his feet. And, and she noticed uh, with her tears, and she noticed that her tears had streamed onto his feet. And she got aware, and she undid her hair, and she began to dry his feet. And then she began to kiss his feet. And we know the story, how Simon the Pharisee was there. And he said, uh, you know, if, if this man were truly a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is that's touching him. Because she's a sinner. I mean, this was a, this was a prostitute. This is a, a person in the, in the, uh, the town everybody knew. This is, this is an immoral woman. And that's when Jesus spoke to him and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And, and Simon says, well, say on. And he gives that story about two men who owed a great sum and went a lesser sum to a man. But, but this man who had, had been owed the sums of money completely forgave both of them. And then Jesus said, I want to ask you a question. Who would love him more? And then Simon, with indifference, with this attitude of indifference, says, well, I suppose the one who owed him more. And he says, do you see this woman? 
Do you see her? No, you really don't. What she is in your mind is just a sinner. What she is in your mind is somebody that's a castaway, somebody that is used by other people and thrown away and forgotten. That's how you look at her. You're a religious man. That's how you look at this woman. Let me tell you something. You haven't looked at her. And he begins to say, she's kissed me and she's washed my, my feet with her tears. Why'd she do that, Simon? Because the one who's been forgiven much loves much. The one who's forgiven, how much do you love Jesus? Have you thought about what you were without him? Have you? Do you remember what you were without him? Look what he's done in your life now. Look how he's transformed you. He's made you so different. That comes to the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what salvation is. That's what God wants to do. He wants to make us into men, into men that are after his image. You know, when it speaks of her washing his feet with her tears, it, there's, there's something interesting I've shared with the fellowship before. You go to Israel and you go to some of these, these shops and they'll sell you these small vases and they're for your tears. They're called tear vials. And you can actually buy them. And you go into the store and the little vials. And what would happen in the old days is, is when someone would cry, they would, they would cry into the bottle and then they would cap it. And it comes out of the psalm, Psalm 56, verse 8. You have kept record of my days of wandering. You have stored my tears in your bottle and counted each of them. When this woman came and washed the feet of Christ, it's not simply that she was tearing up and, and the tears were balling up on her chin and dropped. She, she more than likely had a tear vial, a large one, a lot of tears that she was able to break that pour it on and just thank you. You're the one who has healed my broken heart. You're the one who's dried up these tears. You're the one who's given me forgiveness. Of course I'm going to kiss your feet. Of course I'm going to anoint your head. Of course I'm going to love you. Look what you've done for me. That's not feminine. That's human. That's human, guys. To be broken and repaired. To have a life that's been changed by the grace of God. And God's grace has been poured out on us so that our lives would be living testimonies. It's not poured out on us to continue in sin and go to heaven. In Romans 6, 1 and 2, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Again, some confessing Christians have misunderstood the grace of God. They believe that they're saved, but they practice unrepentant sin, sexual immorality. They're separated from their wives, but they're out there dating women. They're caught up in internet porn. They're greedy, they're filled with anger, they're doing drugs, they're drinking and fighting, they're lying, they're cheating, they're gambling. And all along saying, well, I love Jesus, I know him. That's just not true. This is where the teaching of God's word comes in. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, in, in, in chapter 44, verses 23 and 24, God tells Ezekiel that the priests are going to perform a duty in the kingdom. He says, the priest shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. In controversy, they shall stand as judges and judge and judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed meetings, and they shall hollow my Sabbaths. In other words, they're going to demonstrate to God's people what pleases or displeases the Lord. They're going to judge according to God's judgments, his laws, his statutes, and they're going to be living examples of what they are. And in doing so, they'll teach other people. You see, that's what pastors in the New Testament are to do. The pastor is to live and the pastor is to give. And the pastor is to know what is good and what is bad. And what is the standard that is used to determine what is good and what is bad? It's the word of God. Because it's the teaching of the word of God that gives people understanding and discernment. In Psalm 40, verse 8, it says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. In Psalm 119, 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's why I'm so blessed to see you fellas showed up today. Thank God you're here. Getting in the word, having fellowship. It's refreshing. It's not just a good breakfast, so the breakfast is good. John ate two or three of them. <laughs> but it's the fellowship, guys. Because a lot of men are lonely. 
a lot of men remember when they were young how they had good times. And then they got married. <laughs> Think back for a second when you were a kid and you had, if you had friends, I had a few, how you would kind of hang around when you're 10, 12, 13. What do you want to do when you grow up? You would talk about your you know, story. You'd say, I want to do this. I'm going to do that. I hope to do this. I want to do that. What kind of car are you going to get? Oh, I'd like to get this car or that car someday. We had plans. We had dreams. You play on sports teams or get involved in some kind of thing that, that develops relationship. And if you look back into your early years, most of us can do this. A lot of the things that matter to us that are the like good memories of our lives, they're, they're related to hanging around with guys, you know, when we played ball together, we'd go out in the street, you know, we, I'm of that generation when the street lights came on, you went in. I'm from that generation, that's a true generation, that really happened. We'd play outside until the street lights came on, then we had to go inside. And that was our life. Our buddies, we'd sit outside, we'd talk about our dreams, what kind of girl you wanna marry, things like that. And you go through life, you get your job, you get married, and what a blessing it is. I tease about that, but what a blessing it is to have a good woman in my life like I do. But I still enjoy the guys. I still enjoy laughing and teasing with the guys and joking around, goofing around, drinking coffee, and talking about our lives together, pouring out, sharing. This is who I really am. This is what I really feel. And if you have a friend or two you can do that with, you're a very rich man because there are a lot of lonely men today that's why we have these kinds of things, to give you an opportunity to be with your brothers, to be with the guys who are like you, guys who feel like you. Because sometimes you're the only guy in the neighborhood, sometimes you're the only guy in the job, sometimes you're the only guy in the school who has a belief in Christ and you're alone, not here. Here you got a lot of brothers, a lot of guys you can, you can talk to and visit with and connect with and prayerfully develop relationship with. You know, because we need that. Because a man who's alone, well, that's not a good thing. What's the first thing God ever said is not good? It is not good that the man should be alone. God created us for fellowship. God created us for fellowship with him, one another, and with our wives, should you have one. And we need that. Because when a man's alone, he can think of and do certain things that he wouldn't necessarily do if he was accountable to somebody else. If he was living the way that he should. And so the grace of God has been given to me, not so I could continue in sin so that I can be free from it. The word has been given to me so that I can be equipped for works of service. Again, in verse 12, if we believe that Christ is coming, then how do we live? Well, soberly, righteously, and godly, he says in this, in this present age. Soberly. We, we live in a focused way. We're not caught up with the things that don't last. We, we live with a, a, a temperate, a sound mind. We stop playing games. We take life seriously. We see our friends and our family in need, especially in need of the Lord. We care about their souls. We see our parents, we see our friends. Some of them are dying, some of them are hurting, and, and, and it sobers us up. We're aware of the days. In 1 Peter 4, 7, it says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So we, we change. We grow up. We stop having to mess around constantly. And we start caring deeply. We also live righteously. That means to live in a just way with integrity. We begin to value things like our reputation. We begin to desire to be examples to other people. We, we want our wives to respect us. We want our kids to honor us. And we want our friends to know that we stand for something. We, we're not goofing around anymore. We're not 13 anymore. We're men. And we act like men. And our kids look to us and our sons look at us and they say, that's the kind of man I want to be. I want to be a man like that. Our girls look us, at us and they say, when I marry, I want a man like my dad. You have to have sobriety to do that. You have to be real to do that. We value these kinds of things, and we live godly. Godly is a life that's earmarked by reverence and respect. We want to be able to point out our lives to our kids, and we can say this to them. 
we can say to our, our sons, if you have a child, we can say to them, live like I do and watch what God will do in your life. A number of years ago, over 20 years ago, I had a serious situation occur in my life where uh, we didn't know at the time what it was. But I, I had episodes of amnesia. I'd be doing exactly what I'm doing right now when everything would just fade. I could still read, but I didn't know where I was. And I was hospitalized. Then they started running tests on me. And it was very serious at one point. The, the neuropsychologist, I asked her, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a drink. I asked her a question. I said to her, how long do I have until I lose my memory completely? Because I was told that I had um, some, uh, my, my left and right temporal lobes were calcified. And they ran a battery of tests on me. And she said, I give you seven to eight years. I was 58 years old at the time, which meant that she was saying to me that I was going to lose my memory completely by the time I was 65. That was, that's kind of serious, I think, you know, it was to me at least. And I had to call my kids into the room here at the church in the office after one of the services because they didn't know what was going on with the father. And I told them, I said, this is, well, at first, my wife is, my wife is very faith-filled, and she said, your dad's going to be okay. And I said, okay, let me talk, because <laughs> mama's going to say something that's not exactly accurate to preserve the children's feelings. I said, I've got seven to eight years. I said, I'm going to lose my memory unless God does a miracle. And I said, you know, I just want you to know this. I want you to know how much I love you. I want you to know how much I love my, my, your, my wife, Mama. And then I looked at my wife and I said this to, and I would like every one of you men to be able to do something similar if you're married again in this way. I said, and I pointed to Marie, my wife, and I said, I am the greatest man this woman has ever known, and I will be the greatest man she'll ever know. And I looked at my kids like that, and how arrogant that can sound to you guys. But I looked at my wife and I said, am I or am I not the greatest man you've ever known? She says, you are the greatest man. See, you should be able to say that with your wife. You should be able to turn to your wife and say, baby doll, am I the greatest man you've ever known? And if she says no, then work on it and become that man. <laughs> Seriously, because... As I'm looking out here, they'd all say no. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just playing with you. But do you see what I'm trying to say, fellas? See, your wife doesn't need an angry man. She needs a loving man. Your wife needs someone who supports her. Your kids need a hero. Look around you. Try and find a hero. You're the hero. You're the man. See, my dad was my hero. I didn't need another man to say, I want to be like him. I want to be like my dad. That's who I want to be like. And I tried to be that man because he was a good man. He was a strong man. He was a caring man, a providing man. And at the end of his days, he was a godly man. And that's what I want. And that comes through the grace of God. It comes through not playing games anymore. Every day that passes by, guys, is one less day. You have opportunity to be a man of God. You need to grow daily in the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to do that, and God has given you the grace for you to do that. You see, I've seen over the years many go home to be with the Lord, and it's been very difficult to, <coughs> Excuse me, in many ways. So I've wanted to be prepared because the bottom line is this, and I'll, I'll move close to close here. What I'm trying to do is, I'm verse 13, I'm looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. 
We've been redeemed from every lawless deed and we're looking for him. He gave himself as a voluntary sacrifice for us. And he wants us to be unique, zealous, he says, for good works. He wants our lives to be evidence that we actually are waiting for him. We want to be, I want to be an overcomer, not overcome, but an overcomer. And I want to live in, in such a way that people know that my life is serious. It's like when Paul said, there's one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, he says, but, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. He said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling or the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want to gain Christ completely. I want to enter into the kingdom of God. I want to see him face to face. And I want to live for him on a daily basis. And I don't want to yield anything that will take me away from him. We had a fellow in the church. His name was Sam. Sam approached me after church on one occasion to introduce himself to me. And he told me that he had come to our church on one occasion and that he enjoyed the worship team. He said, and then I came out and preached. And he said, he hated me. He said, and he's telling me, he's telling me, he goes, you know, I just hated you. I didn't want to hear you ever again. And I said, well, that's very sweet of you and kind. Anything else you might want to share with me that's on your heart? He said, and so he says, I left. He says, I left. And I said, I'll never go back to the church like that. I don't like that guy. And I said, well, Marie says the same thing every day, but she can't leave. <laughs> so I said, oh, wow. Well. He goes, yeah, but let me tell you something. He said, he said, I didn't know that you had been meeting in one location and that you had moved here. He said, so it was Easter, and I was driving, looking for a place to go to church. He said, and you came pulling past here. He said, I saw a line of cars coming into the parking lot, and I got in the line because I was looking for a church. He said, but I didn't want to wait. I got impatient, and I left. He said, but the next week I came back. He said, and the next week when I came back, I came in, sat in here. The worship team played. I loved them, and then you came out. And he said it like that. He said, and then you came out. And he said, and I thought, oh, no, that's a guy I hate. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah. He said, but this time I listened. He said, this time I listened. I gave my heart to Christ. And I, I said, well, that's, that's wonderful, Sam. He says, I'm not through. I said, oh, I wish you were, Sam. <laughs> really? He goes, yeah. He goes, I want your prayers. That's why I came. He said, I got a phone call from a girlfriend that I'd been intimate with, and she had been diagnosed with AIDS. And she told me I have to take a blood test to find out whether I have it and that I have to connect with anybody I've been intimate with since her. See, so he says, so I called this other girl. I went, did the blood test, and he said, I came out positive. So he said, I get a call from the same girl, and she tells me I had a retest, and I came out negative. And then he called the other girl that he'd been with, and she had a retest, and she came out negative. So he said, I'm thinking that I'm negative. So I went and got a second test. He said, Pastor David, he says, I'm positive. And Sam did have AIDS. And Sam stayed here in the church. And he ministered. He went on mission trips and he did everything we could do with him, keeping him obviously being aware of, of what he was dealing with and all. And then I buried him. He died of AIDS. I've never forgotten, and this is what I want to close with with you guys. If Sam would have received Christ the first time he heard, you know that time I mentioned that he came, he got mad, and he left? Another year went by. If he would have come to faith, in, if he would have yielded himself that day, he'd still be with us by God's grace. But he didn't. He didn't. He thought he had another day. He thought he had more time. But he didn't. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in an acceptable time, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I've helped you. And then he went on to say, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So for those of you who know the Lord, stand strong in him and in the power of his might.
But for those who aren't, you aren't saved, today is the day of salvation. 